I want you to think for a second. If your Father in Heaven offered to give you a special Easter basket this Easter, what would you like to receive in your basket? You want the, the world's largest chocolate Easter bunny? <laughs> Filled with peanut butter, okay. Um, but there, there's something you need to consider uh, when you start thinking about this Easter basket you want to get from God. Because most of us understand that on Easter Sunday, most of us don't get an Easter basket from an enemy. Would you agree? That's kind of common sense. You don't normally get an Easter basket filled with goodies from a, a true enemy. And when you look in all of Scripture, Scripture says that if, if you're living in sin, if you're a sinner, you're an enemy of God. And we're not throwing stones at anybody when we say that because we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And if we're in faith in Christ, we're sinners saved by faith, right? That's an awesome thing. We praise God for that. But for everybody that's not living by faith, they're an enemy of God. And so there's not a whole lot of presence to look forward to from God if you're an enemy of God, right? Wouldn't you agree that that's, that's probably not going to happen? Except on Easter, God gave everybody the most miraculous gift in Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at this this morning. And the baptismal tank is emptying, and I can hear it. Can you guys hear it? Yeah. I just wanted to, you know, see if it's just not me. Okay. Yeah. It's just a little bit louder than usual right now. Well, praise God for that. Okay. Uh, it's just reminding us of Jesus being our living water. Okay. When we consider what God has to say to us about the gifts he wants to give and, and all the work he's done, there's one word that sums this up, and you can see this in Colossians chapter 1. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And the idea here is God reconciling enemies and sinners to himself. And in this world, reconciliation is next to impossible, right? As a matter of fact, we have a family court right down here a few miles. And in that family court, reconciliation rarely happens, even with all the professionals working towards that. Uh, usually people don't walk out of there reconciled. They walk out of there unhappy and hurt. But God works for our reconciliation. And we're going to look, starting in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9, we're going to look at some of the goodies that God wants to give everybody on this planet, including you and I. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. And you need to be reminded right now that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit literally pray for you without ceasing. Constantly. God himself is praying for you. And that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. These are the goodies that God wants to put in your Easter basket. And the amazing thing is, he does this with people that he changes from sinners to saints. He reconciles sinners and draws them into his family. And so the first gift he wants to give you is this personal, overflowing, experiential knowledge of God. When the Word of God talks about knowing him, you know, that you would be filled with a knowledge of his will. This is not just head knowledge. Like, we go to school, the teachers teach you facts, and then you're tested on them Friday, right? Or maybe you get a pop quiz the next day and you're supposed to write those things on a piece of paper or fill in the correct bubble and hand them back and then you're graded. And so you're supposed to remember this stuff with your head, but whether or not you ever live it is another matter, right? I mean, how many of you still use the quadratic formula? Anybody? The hands of the mathematicians go up fast. But all the rest of us are like, what? That quadratic what? God wants to give you a gift of experiencing him so that your knowledge, your experience, your awareness, your fulfillment of him grows day by day. This is a gift God gives you. So the older you grow in Christ, 
the more experiences you will have of God. Amen? And you get to praise him more and more and more. And so it's a great thing to start off your life in Christ as a third grader. Because as you live your life following Jesus, you experience God more and more. And so by the time she's my age, and she can't even imagine being that old. By the time you're my age, you've got a wealth of experiences. They're tremendous and awesome. And you have this testimony that change of not only your life, but how God has worked in all the people around you. And, and so this beautiful little third grade girl, Addison, who's just placed her faith in Jesus and been baptized, she's now going to live a life of experiencing God more and more and more. Praise God. This is a gift he gives. This is something he wants for all of us, that we have this overflowing personal experience of God. And he does it so that we can walk with Jesus. Jesus invites us to follow him. So we get to walk with him. We get to walk in a manner that pleases him, which is completely contradictory to the world, isn't it? Because the world tells you to do what? Please yourself. 3,000 times a day, you're brainwashed with this message. Please yourself, please yourself, please yourself. No, please Jesus, please Jesus, please Jesus. So in everything you do in your life, please Jesus. Do you realize how trouble-free our lives would be if we literally did everything we do to please Jesus? Seriously, there would never be any more road rage if every person simply drove to please Jesus. It has a profound impact, doesn't it? We can change the world simply by pleasing Jesus. And in doing this, we get to bear his fruit in every good work. We won't live lives that are fruitless. We'll live lives that are filled with supernatural fruit from the good things we do that bless other people. Now, sometimes we don't see the fruit of our good works. And I want to give you a little example of this. How many of you remember uh, the middle of 2013, that I talked about a homeless man named Kevin that I was working with and trying to help him get off the streets. Okay, some of you remember Kevin. Well, here's the end of the story that you haven't heard recently. Because with our work and the work of some counselors in AA, uh, Kevin actually got off the streets here in Sacramento and he got into a rehab home. And so he was doing the AA program and he was uh, getting off of alcohol and drugs and he's clean and he's sober and he's going through the program and going to the meetings every day. He's in a halfway house, a rehab house, here in Sacramento, and he was doing the program. He's, he's going to church. He's worshiping God. He's serving the church. He was doing all these things to grow. And as he changed his life in these baby steps, right, but huge steps, these are big deals, a family that he has not seen in more than two decades, more than 20 years, reached out to Kevin. And they invited him to come home, back east. So that's where Kevin is. That's why you don't hear me talking about Kevin anymore. Kevin's now with his family and he's living his life in Christ, and he's clean and sober and with his family that he has not seen in more than 20 years. So you had an impact in Kevin getting sober. You had an impact with Kevin getting off the streets. And because of your work, primarily through me, but your work, you prayed for Kevin. We had an impact. We have borne fruit that is still growing. So you don't always see the work that God is doing, but God is always bearing good fruit. And we need to trust Jesus that he's doing this continually. And when we do this, when we're overflowed with experience with Jesus, when we walk in a manner worthy to please him, when we bear fruit in all our good works, he strengthens us with all power according to his glorious might. And we don't always feel mighty. I mean, this last week, I did not feel mighty. As a matter of fact, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday were brutally hard days because I was with the family in Kaiser Hospital and it was very painful, filled with grief. We were all praying for a miracle. But God didn't give us the miracle we were praying for. And I, I came to the end of that week, Thursday, exhausted and weak. And God revealed his strength. God met that family in profound ways, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday. And I had no ability. I had no control. None of us did. Not even the doctors. But God was there. And God reveals his might. And he even doubles it. He increases it in ways we can't even imagine. When we just simply walk in a manner worthy of Jesus. These are gifts that God gives. Even in horrible situations, God reveals himself 
in places that we may not want to be in that moment, but God is there with us and he will reveal his might in ways that bring healing, in ways that, that bring joy, in ways that reveal his love. God does this. And when we are dwelling even in our weakness, but doing his good works and pleasing Jesus, we are in the moment attaining steadfastness and patience and joy. And you and I want to skip the steadfastness and the patience. We want the joy. It's like when we get our Easter baskets from our moms and dads as little kids, we want to jump right in and get the candy, right? Whether we've had breakfast yet or not, we want the candy. And God says, no, you, you get the joy, but you have to get the steadfastness and the patience first. And then how many of you remember as being a little kid and your mom or dad telling you to be patient? Did you ever hear that? I heard it constantly. I grew to hate that word, patience. And, and yeah, I, I saw a little hand back there, little boy's hand. Yes, I agree with you. Um, I hated that word as a little kid. Uh, but now I understand the wisdom of God and the power of patience. Because when you grow in patience, you're growing in the very fruit of the Spirit of God. It is a fruit of the Spirit. So God himself is patient. So if you want to draw close to God, you have to grow in patience. So God gives this gift in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And we grow in patience. And we grow in the ability to be steadfast, which means to endure difficulties. You, you keep on following Jesus. You, you keep on doing the good works. You, you keep on pleasing him in, in all of your life. And you just keep on doing this even when times are tough. And it, the, the result of that is joy. That's how we grow in Christ. And so these are gifts that God gives. And the result of the joy which is awesome and powerful and it it's, you know, lights up the whole world, right? When you're filled with joy, it doesn't get any better. We give thanks. And in giving thanks, let's look at verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Giving thanks. The more we grow in Christ, the more we have to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. Never a day goes by that God is not working in our lives and we have concrete things to praise Him for and to be thankful for. And here's one of them. He's qualified us. He has done the work to qualify us to share in the inheritance of the saints. Put it this way. If you were an enemy of Bill Gates... Do you think you're going to share in his inheritance? Probably not. But as a sinner, an enemy of God, who deserves hell and punishment forever, God has qualified us through the cross of Jesus, through his shed blood, through his death and resurrection. He has given us a share of the inheritance of the saints, which is Far more than Bill Gates ever thinks he's got. God owns everything in heaven and earth. And that inheritance he gives us in Christ. So in Christ you have a share of that inheritance from God. He's given it to you. He's qualified you. You don't earn this. You don't deserve this. There's no application you can get from the bank to qualify for this inheritance. No lawyer can help you get this. No court will even accept an application on your behalf for God's inheritance. Only God can quali qualify you for this, and that's what Jesus has done. He has qualified us to share in, in his inheritance. And he's delivered us from the domain of darkness. And most of us, we understand darkness. I mean, most of us at some point in our life have been in a cave or in a dark place, and so yet we understand how weird that is to be in total darkness. But I want you to think of it in even more concrete terms. What do you think it's like when you're dead and buried in a grave? Is there any light? Nope. That's darkness. That's total darkness because dead eyeballs see no light. Right? So when you're dead and you're buried, you're, you're in the coffin, you're six feet under, there's zero light and zero life. Right? And that's what we're all like when we're sinners. We're in the domain of darkness. We're in the domain of sin and death. And yet Christ 
through his cross, his death and burial and resurrection, frees us from sin and death and hell, the grave. He frees us from all that. He takes us out of that domain, that coffin that we're locked in, and he brings us into his light and his kingdom and gives us his new life. So I don't appreciate or enjoy or encourage anybody to watch zombie movies, but it's almost like God's taken all of us sinful zombies and he's brought us back to life, brand new life, glorious light, holy life in Christ. That's what God has done. He's transferred you from the domain of darkness into his light. This is a gift God's given you. And he's transferred us to his kingdom, the kingdom of his beloved son. When we're sinners, we're his enemy. And we're in the kingdom of sin. We're in the kingdom of death. And none of us actually want to live there. But if you talk to most normal, sinful people in the world, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family that aren't following Jesus, they are happy in their sin, aren't they? They're happy in their kingdom until it crashes and burns around them. And then they realize, you know, I, I really don't enjoy this kingdom so much. And that's when they start looking to Jesus. And that's when we can be there lovingly, kindly, compassionately to share this gift. The gift of God freeing them from the domain of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of the beloved son. Filled with God's love. A place of love and a place of light and a place of joy. A place of healing. A place of transformation. And these are the gifts God gives freely in Christ. This Easter basket is really big. God is giving you miraculous size gifts. And it is God doing this. And God shows us this in Colossians chapter 1. Because as we look at verses 15 through 19, we see something remarkable. Jesus is just not good. He's just not a good guy. He's just not a master teacher. He's not some guru. And he's certainly not uh, somebody on TV always asking you for money. That's not Jesus. Jesus is God. He is God Almighty. In verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. You can't see God. So Jesus is his image. He reveals God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might, have, might come to have the first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. In that first phrase, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact likeness and very form of God. So if you want to see God, all you have to do is see Jesus. Look to Jesus. The Greek word is icon. And there's not a really good translation of that in English. We don't have a word like that in English. But it does mean the exact form, the exact representation. And that's what Jesus is. If you want to see God, you have to look to Jesus. He is the only way to see God. And when it says he's firstborn, that doesn't mean that he was firstborn like in your family. I'm the firstborn son in my family. But that doesn't refer to Jesus being just simply the firstborn in the human sense. In this language, this Greek language that's translated into English actually means to give and to be the preeminent in position in all things. In Jesus' day, to be the firstborn was to have the authority over the family. And so you're preeminent in your position of authority over all. And that's what this phrase means in verse 16 and 15. That he is preeminent in position over not just a family, but all of creation. Why? Because Jesus created all things. Every atom, every molecule, everything that even nuclear physicists can't even detect yet, Everything was created by Jesus. As a matter of fact, it says that he not only created all things, he holds all things together. And theoretical physicists have actually created a name of a subatomic particle that they call a gluon. 
You can look this up. This is true. A gluon is a particle that they have theorized holds all matter together, and that's why they call it glue on. I'm not making this up. This is for real. You could pay a lot of money at Stanford to get this education. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm not making fun of theoretical nuclear physicists because these guys do great work. I mean, their science is awesome. But they can't see a gluon. They just know it has to exist. Otherwise, none of the subatomic particles would stay together. They've got properties that would resist each other. It's kind of like us and our sinful natures resisting each other. It's tough for people to get along even in one family, right? And you love each other. Okay, so subatomic particles don't love each other and there has to be something to hold them together. And the Word of God tells us Jesus holds all things together. It's His own will, His own thought that holds you together. Praise God that He thinks that highly of you. That He keeps you together. And He does all this for Himself. He holds all things together for His glory. The fullness of all of God's deity dwells in Jesus. Some people throughout history and this is true today, have made either one of two mistakes about Jesus. Either they think of him as just a man, or they think of him as not a man, just God, not human. And, and so that's a classic mistake, and, and there's cults throughout history that have made this mistake. There's even cults around today that still make this mistake. And they call Jesus either a God, one of many, or just a man who is a good teacher. Cults that go both ways. But the Word of God tells us very clearly in these verses that Jesus has all the fullness of God's deity. So all the fullness of God's holiness, all the fullness of God's power, all the fullness of God's transcendence, all the fullness of God's, I don't know, pick any really amazing thing about God. Jesus is full of that pure essence of God. All that God is, is in Jesus. He is God. Fully, completely. And so when we look at the, the Easter basket of miraculous goodies that God is giving us in Christ, it's God that has done all this work for us. God himself, Jesus, has done this. And he's given this Easter basket of goodies to sinners who were in rebellion against him. That's us. So think about the implication of this for a second. Is there anybody on this planet you don't really get along with? If we're going to walk as followers of Jesus that please him in all respects, the minister of reconciliation is each of ours. To follow Jesus means to walk like him, talk like him, serve like him, and love like him. And it means that with all people, we have this ongoing work of God to reconcile sinners to God and, and reconcile people we don't get along with with ourselves. It doesn't mean you have to change your thinking to be like their thinking, but it means that we are like Jesus. And you know what Jesus was like with every sinner he met. How was Jesus? He was kind. He was compassionate. He listened. He would have lunch with anybody, whether he agreed with them or not, he would sit down with them and bless them in their home. Jesus gave of himself to all people. And so this is our ministry as well, to reconcile people, to have peace with people through Jesus. We have peace through the blood of Jesus in his cross and his death and his resurrection. This is verses 20 through 23. And through him, Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, and, and this is all of us, yet he has now reconciled you, this is personal, in his fleshly body through death, his death, in order to present you to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in your faith, firmly established 
and steadfast. So the conclusion, the the, the bottom of the inside of your Easter basket, when you're scrambling for that last bit of candy, this is the last gift God gives. As we continue in our faith in Christ, He presents us before Him holy and blameless. So everything you've ever done in your life that you are personally ashamed of is gone. Nobody can hold anything against you. Not even Satan can speak a word against you because God himself presents you as holy and blameless before him. So before God, you're holy and blameless. Did you wake up this morning feeling holy and blameless? All of us have done things in our life that we're not proud of. And those are now gone in Christ. He's reconciled us to him. He's taken our sins away. He's redeemed us and reconciled us, brought us out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of light, his kingdom, filled with his love. Jesus has done this and made us holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Nobody can say a word against you because God himself has declared you holy in Christ. And this is where we are to live. We are to live and continue in our faith And going back to the first few verses, uh, that we would be persistent in our faith. That we would be steadfast in our faith. That we would be like Jesus in his walking this earth when he was making disciples and, and doing miracles. He was steadfast. He was patient. He was filled with joy. Even though occasionally frustrated by disciples that weren't quite getting it like you and I, right? We continue in our faith. He presents us holy and blameless. What do you think of this Easter basket? are, Are these some good gifts? I'm amazed that we get to celebrate Easter every year and recognize again in a fresh way all the things God has done for each of us and he continues to do. Because God is continuing these works today. Yes, the cross was 2,000 years ago. And the resurrection of Jesus was 2,000 years ago. But today, he is working these same miracles, not only in our lives, but in the lives of our friends and our family, our neighbors, our co-workers, the people we go to school with. And I invite you to be in prayer between now and next Sunday that you will use these cards, these invitation cards, and you'll give them to your family members. You'll give them to your co-workers. You'll give them to your neighbors prayerfully. And say... You know, Jesus loves you, and and I just want you to be connected closer with him. That's it. Just want you to have a deeper connection to the love of God. And see what God does in their life. Amen? So, don't forget to take these with you. Now, before we close, uh, and before we have our final blessing, uh, I want to remind you that our Easter services next week are at 6.30 in the morning. Easter Sunday, sunrise service. Those of you that like to get up early. Uh, you don't all have to get up early, but we will have a sunrise service. You're welcome to be here at 6.30, and it'll be right here on the side. Uh, rain or shine, it's right here, and the sun comes up in the east. We face the east, watch the sun come up, praise God. Uh, we will celebrate Jesus' resurrection at 6.30, and then uh, our main service will be at 10. So we're not going to have two you know, of our normal you know, 9 and 10.30 services. We're going to have one 10 o'clock service. That'll be Easter. And then we have the, the children's ministry meeting on April 27th. That'll be right after the second service. So the last Sunday of the month, we're going to have a a ministry meeting for every adult that is interested in being a part of us blessing kids in Jesus' name. And I hope that's all of you. Uh, Today, after this service, we are going to have a brief meeting for everybody that's interested in being uh, a man or woman of prayer during our worship service because we want to do more prayer during our worship. And so we're going to have times of prayer where uh, if anybody that wants to come forward can receive prayer during our worship. So we're going to have women pray with women, men pray with men. So I hope that many of you will come forward for about a 10 to 15 minute meeting. Just little practical tips about how we're going to pray for each other during worship. So it'll be 10 to 15 minutes right after the service in the meeting room right back here. So I know you're going to want to say hi to people and get a piece of the birthday cake. That's all good. Spend five minutes doing that and then run back here for our meeting, okay? So be a part of the prayer meeting. And then uh, I want to ask you all to be in prayer for this one thing. Uh, Tim Wickham is stepping down as our worship director, and uh, his new job has uh, 
just taking a toll on time from his family. He has to do a lot of traveling, and, and he just feels the stress of not being able to be with his wife and his son. And so he wants to step down and spend more time with his family, and I completely appreciate that. But I would like you all to let Tim know just how much you love him and appreciate him, and Sharon as well, because I know when, when Tim's away from the family, that's stressful on Sharon. So please uh, bless them both and let them know how much you love them, and we do appreciate them. And so please uh, bless them with that. And then be in prayer for who God wants to be our worship director. And, and we want God to, to do this. This is a work of God we want to see. This is a blessing we want to receive from God. So we know God wants to give us a, a great blessing for our future. We're looking forward to that. So I want to invite you to be in prayer for that. Amen. So please stand. We'll have a closing blessing. As you go forth from this place, I ask you to walk with Jesus, to fully please him in every way. And watch him do great works through you to be a blessing to other people. In Jesus' name, amen.